Today's case is an example that domestic violence can happen to anyone at any age. Whether you're an adult who's stuck with your abuser or you're a young teenager who's just starting out in the dating world, domestic violence can happen to anyone. It's so very unfortunate, but that is the harsh truth. In today's case, we will hear about a young teenage girl with so much life ahead of her. Someone who is looking forward to everything that was to come after graduating from high school. But her life was ripped away from her so suddenly and for no reason at all. But before we get into the case, I want to say a huge thank you to Homeaglow for partnering with me on today's video. Spring is here and now is the perfect time to give your home that much needed TLC. Homeaglow makes finding a cleaner and scheduling a cleaning so easy and affordable. To schedule a cleaning, all you have to do is go to Homeaglow's website and choose the date and time you're looking for, as well as the duration of the cleaning, and you will see all of the available cleaners in your area. Then you can browse the photos and reviews for all of the background checked cleaners before choosing the right cleaner for you. Their schedules are super flexible. You can get your cleaning done within the same week or you can schedule it in advance, whatever fits your busy schedule. For me, I live in a house full of roommates. We always have people over coming and going and we have two dogs, so things get quite chaotic in here. We all have our doctorates and work full-time in healthcare, so it's really nice to just take some times to ourselves once in a while and get the cleaning done professionally. It really just takes a huge weight off of our shoulders and gives us one last thing to worry about. When I decided on Homeaglow for my spring cleaning, I went to their website, found my cleaner, and she came to my home just three days later and within the exact time window that I asked for. I got the six-hour cleaning service, and let me tell you, my cleaner was phenomenal. She had amazing reviews, she seemed so nice based on her bio, and her work really lived up to my expectations. I asked her to focus mostly on the bathrooms and kitchen, and by the time she left, they felt like completely new spaces. The other thing I love about Homeaglow is that 100% of the cleaning fees and tips goes directly to my cleaner, so I know that I'm supporting the amazing cleaners who take the time to make my home feel whole again. And if you're someone who wants more frequent cleanings to make sure you're keeping your home in tip-top shape, you can sign up for their Forever Clean membership, which saves you $30 per hour on all future cleanings. You can book unlimited cleanings starting at just $19 per hour, backed by Homeaglow's happiness guarantee. So take home cleaning off your plate this spring by using Homeaglow. Head to homeaglow.com slash Rachel Shannon or scan the QR code to get your first three hours of cleaning for only $19. Once again, that's homeaglow.com slash Rachel Shannon or scan the QR code to get your first three hours of cleaning for only $19. Thank you again so much to Homeaglow for partnering with me on today's video. Okay, with that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic case of Ellie Gold. Ellie Gold was born February 6, 2002 to parents Matt and Carol Gold in Con Wiltshire, England. Ellie also had an older brother named Ben, as well as cousins and grandparents who lived in the area, all of whom she was extremely close with. Ellie was described by those who knew her as being a kind, caring, and vivacious young woman. She was known to be so much fun to be around. She was popular with a wide group of friends, which made sense because everyone who met her loved her. Her friends would later say that she was the type of person who would go out of her way to make sure that no one ever felt excluded or upset. She truly was the glue that held her friends together. From an early age, Ellie had a deep love for animals. She would visit farms to hold chicks, baby rabbits, and feed animals. Eventually, she grew a passion for horses. She went on to start riding horses, spending her summers at the stables in the Wiltshire countryside. She loved riding horses so much that every single year from the age of six, her Christmas list would always have at least one thing a pony. When she was younger, they adopted a pony at a stable in the area, but they could only visit a few times a year because the stable was a bit of a drive away. Finally, her family did decide that since they did live in a rural area, they were going to buy Allie a pony. The first pony they bought her was white with a long flowing mane and tail. She looked like a unicorn when she was white, but more often than not, she looked brown because she loved rolling around in the mud. After getting the pony, Ellie would spend hours on end brushing her mane and tail. She showed her off in shows, coming in first one year in the Foxham shows in the best family pony class. When she got older, she got another pony named Blackjack. 
Once again, with Blackjack, she would compete in competitions all across the country in agility and racing events. She would also just spend time with her horse going on casual rides on the countryside. It was just part of her makeup every weekend, whatever weather's in the week as well, mucking out stables and, and seeing to her horses. That was, that was her life. Everyone who knew Ellie knew just how much she loved her horses. And Merlin was one of her favourites. She'd always go and pet him and sneak him carrots and pony nuts. Now she's gone, her family want to give to something their daughter believed in. Good girl. Well, Ellie was passionate about the riding for disabled because she used to see how it benefited the children and adults. And obviously her pony, Blackjack, used to sometimes do riding for disabled work. And she really loved that idea that on a Monday morning he was giving a lot of pleasure to some children. What would Ellie think about you being here? Good on you, Mum. You've walked after me on horses for all these years and now you're helping other children. But I've walked with her for miles and miles when she was younger with her horses. I didn't let her go on her own. It was only when she, you know, became a confident rider that she would go off with her friends riding. But I'd still sit in the car waiting for her to come back, thinking they should be back by now. Where are they? <laughs> As a teenager, Ellie had dreams of soon going off to university to study psychology and joining the Mounted Police. At the time, Ellie was just 17 years old and in her 12th year at the Hardin Hughes School. By January of 2019, Ellie came home to tell her mom that a new boy had asked her out. It was fellow classmate at school, 17-year-old Thomas Griffiths. Both Ellie and Thomas were studying for their A-levels or their advanced levels at the time. A-levels are basically advanced placement courses taken for a few specific subjects, which you then take exams for, and if you pass, it is a great stepping stone for getting yourself into university after graduation. So clearly, both Ellie and Thomas were good, hard-working students. Thomas was athletic and played rugby, and the two had actually known each other since year seven. Ellie had liked him for a while before he asked her out, and he was her first boyfriend, so she was really excited to go home and tell her mom the news. For the months that followed, as Ellie and Thomas dated, Ellie's mother said that he would come over for dinner sometimes, but he was always really quiet. Matt, Ellie's father, wasn't too fond of him because of how quiet he was. He never really had much to say. There wasn't really much that stood out about Thomas. They really didn't think that he was a good match for Ellie, who was outgoing, talkative, and bubbly. Again, this was Ellie's first boyfriend, so her parents knew that it wouldn't be anything serious and that it would fizzle out relatively quickly. And that's pretty much exactly what happened. On May 2nd, 2019, three months after the relationship started, Ellie realized that she had a lot more important things in her life to worry about. She told Thomas that she no longer wanted a relationship with him, that she wanted to focus on herself, studying for her A-level exams, and getting into university. After the breakup, she told friends that she was relieved after breaking things off with him. According to Ellie's friends and Ellie's mother, he started to become really possessive and obsessive in the weeks before the breakup. He would say things like, does it not bother you that we're not seeing each other after school? He wanted to be with her and talk to her all day, every day, which just was not what Ellie wanted. She started to get really overwhelmed with all of the attention he would give her, so she was happy to finally have some space. She told friends, though, that he did not take the breakup well, and he seemed really upset. After she broke it off, he would pester her continuously, asking her repeatedly to come over. Of course, she said no, that they were no longer together. She didn't really want to spend time with him outside of school. The morning of May 3rd, 2019 started as normal. The family woke up for the day before Ellie's parents headed off for work. Meanwhile, Ellie stayed home and continued getting ready for her day. She had some cereal and just hung out at home that morning because she didn't have any classes at school. She did have plans, however, to have a friend pick her up around noon so that they could study for their exams together. However, when Matthew, Ellie's father, returned home from work at about 3 p.m., he walked in to find the most horrific, brutal scene imaginable. He went into the kitchen where he found his beloved 17-year-old daughter, Ellie, lying face down on the floor, covered in blood. At first, 
Matthew didn't know what to make of what he was seeing. He immediately went into panic and started trying to make sense of this entire thing. His first thought was that maybe Ellie had an accident. Maybe she had reached for something in the cupboard but then fell and banged her head. But then Matthew noticed that there was blood splattered all over the kitchen, far too much for it to have been caused by a simple fall. That is when he realized that Ellie had a knife sticking out of her throat. The way that her body was positioned, it looked like she was holding onto the knife in her own throat. After that, Matthew describes the next few minutes as a blur. He dialed 999, telling emergency operators that Ellie was dead. The dispatcher was telling him how to try and resuscitate her, but at that time, she was cold to the touch and her body was stiff. He knelt beside her body, just screaming for her to wake up. Then, he called his next-door neighbor for help before calling his wife, Carol, to come home. According to Carol, he told her that Ellie had an accident and she needed to come home immediately. He told her to drive safely. Matthew was just in a state of shock, so he really had no idea what he was saying or how he was acting, but Carol said he was just hysterical. After getting the call, Carol drove the 15 minutes back home. As she neared the house, she started to hear police sirens, but didn't really think that it had anything to do with them. At that point, she didn't think that Ellie was dead. She didn't know that she was lying there, covered in blood. In her head, she was thinking the same thing that Matthew was initially thinking. Maybe Ellie slipped and fell. Maybe she was cooking and cut herself with a knife and was bleeding. But as she pulled up to the house, she saw Matthew outside crying. She saw police cars surrounding the house. And that is when she realized that this was something very, very serious. When Carol got out of the car, she was met with Matt, who was just screaming, she died. But Carolyn said she couldn't believe it. She either just went numb or simply didn't believe what she was hearing. But the news that Carol would soon find out was so much worse than she could have ever imagined. Police officers sat with Matthew and Carol in the police car, telling them that she was dead and that she had been dead for at least four hours. And this was no accident. Ellie had been stabbed multiple, multiple times in her throat in a vicious, frenzied attack. Now, I want to pause here and acknowledge the fact that Matthew continued saying this was an accident, especially when he called Carol, regardless of the fact that there was blood everywhere and there was a knife sticking out of her neck. Some people will find that odd, but I think it's a great example of what our mind will do when you are experiencing this level of trauma. Matthew saw his baby girl lying right there, but it didn't even register to him at first that there was a knife. He saw it, but it just didn't click in his head. It didn't register to him that she had been attacked. Everything was a blur, and I'm sure his body just went into autopilot. He was probably also in denial, not thinking that anybody would want to hurt his daughter. The easiest explanation at that time is an accident. I think this is a really interesting phenomenon that happens to our brains when we are experiencing something like this. Either way, after learning the horrific, life-changing news, officers took Carol and Matt down to the police station to question them and gather more information about Ellie's life, her circle of friends, and who could have possibly wanted to hurt her. The second Carol and Matt were told that this was a murder, they looked at each other and told officers that it was her ex-boyfriend, Thomas Griffiths. After finding Ellie's body and having her parents point out who they believe is responsible, of course, the investigation into her murder started. Ellie's body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy, and that is when it was discovered that Ellie's attacker first tried to subdue her by strangling her. But Ellie fought back. She fought back with everything she had. Her body showed clear signs of defensive wounds, which proved just how much of a fight she put up. Because of this, her attacker then grabbed a knife from the kitchen and stabbed her over and over and over again. She ended up being stabbed in her throat 13 times. Then investigators went ahead and spoke to more of Ellie's friends to get an idea of the days and hours leading to her murder. 
some friends told detectives that Thomas had been sending them messages the morning of Ellie's murder. They said that he sent them a Snapchat showing just the upper corner of his face, talking about how stressed he was and how he's been feeling really down lately. One friend screenshotted the Snapchat, which reads as follows. I think everyone's noticed that I've been really down lately and I need to tell you why. Me and Ellie are going on a break and see how things go after exams. As well as this, my dad has cancer and my nan has been in the hospital having heart problems. I've been so stressed lately and I don't know how to cope with it. I've been scratching myself around the neck area as this group has kind of become my best friends. I don't know who else to talk to. I'm going to see Miss Todd now and explain everything that's been happening. With this Snapchat, him bringing up scratching himself on the neck, it was kind of a way to let friends know that he was self-harming. He wanted them to know that he was in a bad mental state, so the friends responded, all telling him that if he needed to talk, they were there for him. Police also took a look at Ellie's phone to see what her communications were like in the days and hours leading to her death. They found that at 11.45 a.m. on the morning of her murder, Ellie had actually texted her friend who was supposed to pick her up that day, telling her that she didn't actually want to study. She told her not to come to her home and pick her up that day. In addition to this text, they found communication from Thomas asking her if she wanted to meet up. Of course, police also went and spoke with Thomas. One of the first things he asked in that police interview was if Ellie was okay, which obviously she wasn't. He then gave police what he thought was a solid explanation for what he did that day. He told police that his mother had dropped him off at school that morning, which was confirmed by his mother. But he said that after getting to school, he realized that he wasn't feeling good, so he walked over to the Chippenham bus station where he took a bus back home at 8.31 a.m. At that time, he also sent his teachers an email letting them know he'd be absent that day. But after speaking with Thomas's mom, she said that she had returned home after dropping Thomas off at school and she didn't see him come back home. She was under the impression that he was still at school. When investigators asked Thomas about this, he said that even though he wasn't feeling good and was just studying all day, he still didn't want his mom to know that he was home for some reason, so he hid in the closet until she left for work again. That is all he said happened that day. He insisted that he had absolutely nothing to do with Ellie's death. In that police interview, police noticed that Thomas did have fresh scratches on his neck, face, and mouth. Obviously, this could be a sign that he was involved in the attack, but of course, as I stated earlier, he claimed that those scratches were self-inflicted because he was depressed. However, police looked further into Thomas's movements that day using his cell phone records, and that showed a very different story than what he was claiming. Cell phone data showed that at around 10.50 a.m. on May 3rd, Thomas's phone disconnected from his family's home Wi-Fi network. It then showed that he was in the area of Ellie's home by 10.53. It turned out that after his mom left home again, he also left the house driving his family's silver Ford Focus, which I don't think he was legally allowed to drive yet. But either way, cell phone data showed that he was at Ellie's home for about an hour before he left her home at 11.51 a.m. After leaving Ellie's and returning back to his house, CCTV footage captured him leaving his home again, driving the Ford Focus before returning again 18 minutes later. Based on that CCTV footage, police were able to locate where he went during those 18 minutes. It was in an area located about nine minutes away from his house, so it appeared that he went there, stayed for literally a minute or less, and then returned home. They went there, and in that area, police found a black trash bag which contained bloody washcloths and an apron. At the home where Thomas lived, police also found that he had put his clothes into the washing machine. They also located a pair of shoes within the home. Both the clothes and the shoes appeared to have blood on them, but of course, there was an attempt to wash the blood off. Upon later testing, that blood did come back as belonging to Ellie. So at this point in the investigation, police have what they think is a pretty clear picture of what they think happened. Ellie and Thomas started dating. After a few months together, Thomas started to get obsessive and wanted to see Ellie all the time and was expecting a lot out of her. 
This was very overwhelming for Ellie, so after three months of dating, she broke up with him. This absolutely enraged him, and he was not going to accept it. Refusing to let her go, Thomas came up with a plan. He headed to school that day to make his mom think he was there, but he never had any intention of actually attending. He then went back home, but had to hide and wait until his mom left. After that, he drove the family's car to Ellie's, where he first confronted her by strangling her. When that didn't work, he grabbed a kitchen knife and started stabbing her. After killing her, he spent an hour at the home attempting to clean up. He grabbed some cloths from the kitchen and attempted wiping up some of the blood. He then placed the cloths into a plastic garbage bag. After that, he tried washing his shoes in the kitchen sink. He grabbed the knife that he used to kill Ellie and wiped it off with an apron, possibly to remove his own fingerprints, but then he placed it into Ellie's hands in a poor attempt to make the stabbing look self-inflicted. He then grabbed Ellie's hand and used her fingerprint to unlock her phone, texting her friend not to come over so she wouldn't discover this horrific scene. At this point, it was nearing the time that the friend was supposed to pick her up, so he was making sure that no one would catch him at her house. After that, he returned back home to change and immediately put his bloody clothes into the washing machine. He then left home again, heading to that nearby woodsland where he dumped the trash bag full of bloody cloths. Once he returned from the woods, a neighbor actually saw him driving home. So that neighbor then drove Thomas back to school. There, his peers said that he acted normally as if nothing had ever happened. He didn't seem like someone who just murdered his girlfriend. He was cool, calm, and collected. It was very eerie to notice after knowing what he had actually done. After the school day ended, his mom picked him up from school. That's when he sent out that Snapchat to his friends where he described his self-harming and depressed mood. Of course, we know that those marks weren't self-harm, they were actually scratches from Ellie trying to defend herself from Thomas's vicious attack. It did not take long for police to arrest and charge Thomas with Ellie's murder. He was originally charged on suspicion of murder by 6 p.m. on May 3rd, so just three hours after her body was found. His first court date was on May 9th. At that time, he did not enter a plea, and this is when the trial was scheduled for October 28th. For the months that followed his arrest, Thomas insisted that he was not responsible for Ellie's murder. That was until a plea hearing which took place on August 29th, 2019. At that time, Thomas Griffiths actually pleaded guilty to the murder. In doing so, Thomas was giving a new version of events. He said that on the morning of May 3rd, he went over to Ellie's house to study with her. However, while there, they began arguing. Things escalated, and he remembers strangling Ellie, but after that, he doesn't remember anything. However, of course, neither her family nor the prosecution believed that he didn't remember anything. At his sentencing hearing, the prosecution argued that he went there with the purpose of killing Ellie. It was not a heat-of-the-moment thing. He didn't just go there to study because there was evidence that showed that Ellie was not welcoming of Thomas's presence. He went to her house, killed her, and then spent over an hour afterwards trying to clean up his mess. He also purposely put her hands around that knife to make it look like a self-inflicted wound. He then lied to his friends about how he scratched himself, knowing that all of those marks would make him look more guilty. All of this was done to try and hide his involvement. This was a violent, planned, first-degree, intentional homicide. At the sentencing hearing, Ellie's family finally got the chance to face Thomas. They said that while they spoke about how horrific this murder was, how badly this crime has affected their family, he wouldn't even look up at them. At the hearing, a letter that Thomas wrote was read aloud. In the letter, he expressed his remorse, stating, quote, I'm sorry, I know my apologies and explanations will never be enough, but I hope in time I can show how truly sorry I am. I feel confused and angry at myself that I was able to hurt someone so special to me. But the judge in this case did not think that Thomas showed the proper amount of remorse throughout his time in jail and awaiting his sentencing. The judge said, quote, What matters is that she had called a halt to the relationship as she was perfectly entitled to do. You say you were upset by that. In my view, you were a great deal more than upset. 
But he continued, you and you alone know exactly what happened that day, but what is clear is that at some point, you put your hands around Ellie's neck and tried to throttle her. She desperately tried to fight back, scratching at your neck in the process. You did not have the sense or decency to stop. Instead, you picked up a kitchen knife. You then carried out the most appalling attack on this defenseless girl, repeatedly stabbing her to the face and neck. The pain and terror she must have suffered in her last moments as your frenzied knife attack continued is beyond imagining. Most chillingly, you left Ellie on the floor with that knife embedded in her throat and her left hand around the handle of that knife. I have no doubt that you arranged the scene in order that it would appear to those who found Ellie that she had been killed not by another person, but instead by her own hand or in some terrible accident. The effect of your actions has not only been to snuff out the life of this bright, intelligent, talented, and vivacious young woman with her whole life before her, but also to wreak misery and heartbreak on her family and friends. After hearing from Thomas's and Ellie's family, the judge handed down his sentence. The judge sentenced him to 12 years for the murder, but added an additional five due to the aggravating factors in this case. In total, Thomas will spend 17 years behind bars for this horrific murder. Of course, this sentence did not satisfy the family. They were actually appalled at the leniency the courts showed Thomas. He is going to be out of jail in his 30s, which is just horrific to think about. He is so clearly a danger to others, especially women. Ellie's family believe that if he is let out when he's supposed to be, he will go on to hurt others. Matthew said, quote, Griffiths is an evil monster. He is a danger to society, particularly to women. He became obsessed with Ellie within weeks. He could become obsessed with another woman. I believe he is a psychopath. He should be kept locked up for the safety of other women. Continuing, I'm not a person who hates. I do hate him. I pray daily that he does not make it out of prison. Ellie had so much going for her. She was talented and kind. She loved animals. She was a fantastic horsewoman, and she was just so lovely. You'd expect a father to say that of a daughter, but she was delightful. And as a family, she, her older brother Ben, Carol, and I, we did everything together. Ellie's mother said that Thomas was treated like a 10-year-old despite being five months from turning 18 when he committed the crime and was 18 years old when he was sentenced. Now, the reason for Thomas's light sentence is because he was only 17 years old when he committed the murder, therefore he is a minor and considered to have been a child when he did it. But to Ellie's parents, he was more than old enough to know what he was doing. He was old enough to know right from wrong. 17 years old is not a child who needs to be told what behavior is acceptable. Yes, a 17-year-old has much worse impulse control than an adult. Their frontal lobe is not developed, and many 17-year-olds will do stupid things in their life. That is a teenager's job to do stupid things and make mistakes. But there is a massive difference between a 17-year-old sneaking out of their house and drinking in their friend's basement and murdering somebody. Because of this, Ellie's parents worked hard to campaign for longer sentences for teen killers. And by March of 2021, a long two years of hard work paid off. Justice Secretary Robert Buckland announced that they have signed Ellie's law into law. This new law made it so teenage killers can now face sentences up to 27 years. The age this starts at is now 14, which I do think is an appropriate age for someone to have to take full accountability for their actions. When parents are able to take a tragedy that they suffered through and make positive changes, I am always so, so impressed. They now have made it so that everyone 14 years and older will be behind bars for longer and make it less likely that they'll be released too soon and go on to hurt someone else. I don't think this is going to change Thomas's sentence, unfortunately. All we can do is hope that when he is released, he is required to undergo intensive therapy to make sure he does not commit the same type of crime. But honestly, the way he went from zero to 100 in literally one day does not give me much hope for his potential to rehabilitate. I think it's truly terrifying to know that he will be released in his 30s, and I'm praying that he doesn't go on to hurt anybody else. But with that being said, that is all of the information I have on today's video, and now I want to know what you all think. Why do you think this happened? 
Do you think this truly was a planned murder or do you think Thomas really went to Ellie's to talk and then snapped? What do you think of his sentence? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.